Hello, people. Welcome to uh, the Lee Cole 3 podcast with my partner, James Proctor. James, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing really well. How are you today? I did my weigh-in. I lost another five pounds. So, oh, you know, very I'm, good. I'm happy about that. This week, five pounds. No, uh, I mean, that's so, really good, but you have less to, to lose now, you know, so you're your whole volume is smaller. And so I went from having to lose a whole man to now to lose a teenage child, a teenage boy. Yeah. Weight wise. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. No, that, that makes sense. And then, and this is our first show of July. So. Yes, it is. It's our first show of July. It's July 4th weekend. Happy July 4th weekend. Everybody be safe. Do not go out drinking and driving and getting a DUI and messing up your life. Exactly. Okay. If you're going to drink, Stay at home or have a driver and don't be stupid and get into a dumb fight. But anyway, we'll just say that. Okay, so I went to school. I went to mob school. Okay. Yes, James. You know, if you look at, and people are going to say I'm tooting Mikey Scar's horn. Yes, I kind of am. And let me tell you why. Did you watch his last video? Yes, I did. It was really it was interesting. A, the Gotti plot on Paul Castellano, and uh, mm-hmm. he lays it out along with RJ. And I'm going to tell you something. This guy is like a, 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 they talk about mobologist. He's a mobologist with experience because he's lived it. Yeah. And it's amazing how much stuff, you know, I, I don't, I, I can't consider myself at best a novice. And um, when I, you listen to the people like this, The difference between him and Sammy Gavano is he teaches you. He doesn't try to tell you this is how it was. Right, exactly. Where Sammy says, you know, uh, um, let's see, Al Capone went to prison. I was there. I was at the train station. (laughs) I waved goodbye, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and then he took over the Chicago mob. That that would be Sammy. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think it's a it's good for everybody here. For a guy like uh, Mikey Scars, whether you like him as an informant or not, the fact of the matter is he could teach people a lot of things that they don't know about the mafia. Do you agree with that or not? Be honest. I, you know, I really do because, you know, what, because he w- is actually in the life and he has a, a large background, long background. And he's really uh, focused on trying to um, make history right. I, I, I don't see it as necessarily, I mean, everyone's got motives for why they do stuff, but you know, he, he really knows what's going on and, and he knows a lot of the, the key players, especially, you know, in that mafia in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, they how they do is RJ asks him a question and he gives a direct answer. He doesn't play around. He mm-hmm. gives his opinion uh, and, and, and then he mixes facts in with his opinion where yeah. Sammy mixes his opinion into his opinion. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no facts in between. But you, uh, know? you know what I see with uh, Mikey as well is that, you know, he's not one about trying to be the hero in the, each episode that they do. He's not about um, trying to um, embellish. So, you know, I think that he's pretty neutral when it comes to stuff, but he'll, he'll give his opinion. So, you know, I mean, I don't agree with everything, but, you know, I have to say that he's really knowledgeable of – of the genre and it's surprising that some of the people that were actually in that life don't understand the history as much as someone like Mikey. He really understands history. And we're, so I picked out some segments of uh, this video that they did and I'm going to, with permission, we have, we have permission to use it as long as it's not behind the paywall. Yep. And uh, so this, and I would say to everybody, you see that subscribe sign? Go subscribe to Mikey Scars if you really want to learn a lot about the mafia uh, and how it worked. And uh, the heyday of the mafia to me was in the 1980s, Mm -hmm. in the the early 90s. I agree. Yes. So I'm going to start this off and then you could and then then I'll stop it and go to the next section. But you could tell me what you think. Okay. This is RJ asking questions and Mikey giving answers. All right. All right. So the family's assuming that they have the bananas with them. So that's the Colombo, that's the banana. Um, as for the Lucchese family, Tony Ducks Corallo not only hated Castellano, I didn't know that, so that's news to me. I'm going to ask you about that. But um, Tony Ducks Corallo not only hated Castellano, but was immersed in preparing his defense in the forthcoming commission trial. So they're saying, 
uh, Ducks is he's he's dealing with legal issues, and plus he hates Castellano. Um, so they're assuming we're okay there. Think about that. They're writing the Ducks off that he's not going to have any say, right, in the future. Why did they just assume that will pull? Okay, so what he's saying, he's pretty much saying Tony Ducks was facing a lot of charges like Paul Castellano was. Yes. Uh, and and pretty much Paul Castellano quite possibly was a walking dead man because of everything. A lot of people th thought that he could not hold up in prison if he went to prison. And uh, um, so now you got Gotti behind the scenes looking to get permission from people or telling people they're going to take this guy out. So what do you think up to this point, what he has to say? Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with that because, uh, you know, one thing I didn't know was that, you know, the relationship between Castellano and, and, and Tony Ducks, I, I'd assumed that that they they had gotten along. I, I didn't know that. But regarding holding up in prison, um, Castellano um, had, you know, the health issues. We know that he was indicted um, in 84 for the federal racketeering charges. And he was um, in love with his maid. He was in love with his mate. He was on $2 million bail. He also got caught up uh, in what became the Mafia Commission trial. And so he was released on $3 million bail on that. So he had a couple of big um, cases in 85 when he got killed. And so, you know, the thing is, as far as him holding up, I mean, I don't know. I mean, he, he, he needed, I know that he needed, he wasn't comfortable. He, he had his diabetic. He had a lot of issues. I don't. I don't know if he could have held up as well. He would, have, at the very least, had have gone to a, a prison that was a, a medical facility. But you know, it is possible that he could have, um, you know, took an agreement of some sort. And 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 as Mike, he's talking about. If say he goes to prison, I mean, you know, who becomes the next boss of the family? Well, if it's uh, so. Yeah, there's two parts. So it would have been originally uh, a Dela Croce, but he was dying of cancer. So it he couldn't have ever been in there. Been it Tommy would be on the Yeah. So Bilotti became the, you know, when Dela Croce died, then Bilotti became underboss, right? And so he would have been the boss if you go by the chain. And, and you people say Tommy Bilotti was very underqualified to be a boss. He was, he be, went from a driver, a bodyguard for Castellano and his, uh, basically companion to talk to, to being the underboss of the family. Yeah, but you, you got to understand that, you know, I think a lot of people tend to uh, diminish the role of a driver or a bodyguard. You got to understand that people like, uh, for example, uh, Jimmy Brown, who who's a big heavyweight in the Gambino family. He was uh, the driver for Carlo Gambino. Uh, you had... Uh, you had uh, Bobby Borriello that was John Gotti's driver, you know, and he wasn't even made at the time. But by the time, but later he he got enough experience, he became a capo in the family before he right. you know, before he left. So I mean, that is even the chin, you know, he was a a driver. So so yeah, I mean, that's actually a good career move if you can get in that role of a driver. So Bellotti, uh, Joe Bellotti, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. and, the Lottie, okay. though, had, you know, he he actually had um, a big book of business on the street. He was he had a, a crew around him. He so, yeah, I mean, he I mean, he would probably be as qualified, you know, as okay. any others. OK, let me play those more of this. But thank you for that, James. It's a good point. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Counselor. It's a great point. And he also said that. Um, so we know about the Jaguar. He says. Um, that the task force was successful in placing a bug in the Jaguar of, of Corallo's driver. Um, Corallo not only chatted in the car about commission meetings, but also made sneering comments about his fellow bosses, including Castellano. So they, they, they knew he made some disparaging remarks against Paul already. So that's where they're assuming he doesn't matter. Let's just forget about him. But um, I just want to go back to your point. You asked me earlier, if people talk bad about each other in the coffee clutch, I, I alluded to, right? There you go. Good point. Yeah, there you go. 
as we know, gangsters are known to be on wires. It happened to Gotti. Yes. Uh, talking bad about other gangsters. That's yeah, who they I, were. Yeah, and that's something I was going to say. Even it's it's kind of funny though. they gangsters are especially in the Italian mafia of the U.S. Especially in five families, they're they're big gossipers, and I mean, we even have it today, just in this genre of just you know talking with with folks that you know in our everyday of when we prepare for shows and interview people. I mean, they they like to gossip. That's a, a the truth. <laughs> I'm gonna play the next part. I have two more parts. I'm gonna play the next part. It's at 5:30, so I'll just let this. One member of the Lucchese family, however, was a force to be reckoned with. Anthony Gas Pipe Casso. Gas Pipe was tough, Sammy said. But like with everybody, Frankie got along with Gas Pipe and sounded him out in a roundabout way how he thought about Paul and supposed he wasn't the boss no more. So the Chico goes to Gas Pipe and says, hey, what if Paul wasn't the boss anymore? He didn't ask him directly, I want to kill him and I want you to stand with me. What do you think if Paul wasn't here? So you got to Chico, he's really wielding his power. He's behind the scenes, but he doesn't realize he's signing his death warrant. And yep. uh, basically he's behind the scenes putting this whole thing together. It, it shows you the respect level Frank Frankie to Chico had compared to all these other guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point in history, the thing is, is that without Frank DeChico, I don't I don't see uh, Gotti being able to be successful. And so with that hit and then becoming boss, I mean, I, I feel that, that by getting uh, you got someone with Frank DeChico that had the ability to to be friends and be respected by both the Brooklyn factions, you know, maybe the, the old the old guard, along with the people in like Gotti's uh, group with the um, in in Queens and in, in Howard Beach, and so yeah, I, I totally agree, and and I would say that he is more instrumental in this thing than um, than Sammy the Bull Gravano. And for and as we know, four months after they take out Castellano, he's dead. He you is. Know, yes. Bilotti, and, and here we got Bellotti, he's dead. So we got two younger mm -hmm. bosses that uh, within a four four month period were killed. Yeah, and, and then and, we and then we lost Neil Della Croce even before that, who was he cancer. Was under, yeah, you know, underbosses were going. But, but, uh, let's get into the next section yeah, here. Of uh, course. Okay. And Frankie, according to the book, Frankie DeChico says that Gas Pipe told him he didn't give a fuck about Paul. So we figured we had approval there. If ever, if he ever tried to do anything later, we could throw it in his face. So there's that's <laughs> their way of that's their way of getting the Lucchese family. Ducks is gone. The powerhouse there is Gas Pipe, and Gas Pipe told me, "I don't give a fuck about Paul." Gas Pipe's only a captain. He's not an administration. So if you ask anybody in any way, what are you going to do? Get everybody said they don't care about Paul. What does that mean? It's not administrative or commission approval again. Ducks is the boss until he, he, he gives it up, which they didn't know he was going to get up at this point, right? So uh, Gas Pipe is making the decision that he don't care about Paul. It, it, to me, that falls flat, that, that uh, resounding, uh, you know, uh, tribute that they're going to say we're going to stand by you later on when you kill Paul. Do you think Gas Pipe doesn't know what he meant? What did you think he meant? Gas Pipe say, what do you mean? You mean after they lose the case? You think Gas Pipe just said nothing? Wasn't inquisitive? Of course he did. He knew where they were going if the conversation happened. See, that's the thing. That's the key. And this is what Mikey Scar says. If the conversation happened, history is based right now on what Sammy Gravano is saying. Exactly. And so uh, it gets into a very curious position when Sammy keeps creating history. Sammy's the one that says that he went out and he talked to Gas Pipe. We don't even know if it's true. Yeah, and, and that, that's part of it. We don't know if that was, you know, if that was even that ever happened, number one, like you said, and then two, was he in the position to really make a decision for, uh, you know, Tony 
Tony Ducks because, you know, and then, you know, at that point, it wasn't until it was 86 when Tony Ducks actually said that, you know, he needed to make succession plans and then he put Vic and Musso and partnered with Gas Pipe for to run that family. Yeah. And, and where does he even have the power to say that? It all goes through Tony Ducks in the end. I mean, in the yeah, reality. Exactly. But once again, it's Sammy saying it. It could be true. Don't get me wrong. It could be true. But we don't know because Sammy's involved that when it comes to the mafia through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Sammy's involved with all five families. And yeah. every decision goes through Sammy. Yeah, exactly. And it's what still is just interesting to me this the idea that maybe Tony Ducks was you know, didn't like uh, Paul Casalano, and that might be true, but at the same time, that doesn't mean he would have signed off on a, you know, a, on a regime change like that. Okay, I'm going to go to a, let me see the next part here. One second, I'll go to. Okay. They just said, we can't talk to them. So he says here, and this is where we conclude the story. The plotters concluded that the Genovese family was the only one that they would not approach. Big Paul and the Chin went back too far. Too far. They were too tight, Sammy said. They had all their big money arrangements, so we decided, fuck Chin. If it comes down to it, we'll go to war with them. And we decided, when we take down Paul, we got to take out Tommy Bellotti too. They must go together. Everybody agrees to that, one hundred percent. Why take? Uh, why do you have to take Bellotti also? He, he, I don't think he would have capitulated to anything there. With, with even Sean. with a dead Paul, even with a dead Paul. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he would have accepted it. No way. That's my opinion. I, he never would have accepted it. And that makes a lot of sense what he's saying because say he's not with Paul when Paul gets killed, he's the underboss. He say he's sitting at his house and he hears that Paul that Paul got taken out. At that moment, we we're talking secession. Now you got Bobby Brown Fiella that was really yeah uh, in tight with uh, the chin. Yeah, Jimmy Brown was. Yep. So there might be something there, but they might make Jimmy Brown the underboss underneath uh, Bilotti. Who knows? But right. they. People have to remember, no one knew who John Gotti was in 1985. Very few people. I mean, the guys on the street did. I'm talking about uh, his rise to power just came out of no place. Yeah, it was. I mean, that, and that's true. And and so, yeah, I mean, Bilotti would have been next in line, of course. And so, but I, I you know, I agree that they would have, they had to take out both of them uh, if they were going to make this regime change. And so that's what happened. Okay, I'm going to finish this up and we'll take it down in a minute. I don't think he would have stood down. He would have been tripped, right, to a point to say, Frankie's in on this? Joe Watts is in on this? I, I think they made the right decision. And you kill a guy. I'm not, I don't mean they should have been killed. But in that sense of strat strategic moves, tell me, yes, I had to go. Don't forget, they resented him for being the underboss. That fast. What and if you don't kill him, and if you don't kill him, he, he's really the active boss. If if Paul don't want to appoint somebody, right? <clears throat> if they if let's say they just kill Paul, who's the boss? Tommy, go. he's the other <clears throat> boss. Did Tommy have a crew? Yeah, sure. I mean, like he's a tough crew. His brother, his brother, a tough guy. Yeah, yeah, guys around him, absolutely. He thought he, had he have the ability, would he have had the ability to try to hold the family if or he was dead? Well, he would have had to go to the commission. That's the whole thing for backing. Okay. That's actually hit on the boss. All right. Okay. So that's why that was very interesting stuff, don't you think? Yeah, I mean it is because you know you're there's a lot of what it is. It's like a, a chess, like a chess game. There were so many pieces in play with, you know, it wasn't just some, you know, event within this Gambino crime family. It was involving, you know, everyone on the, the commission. And then also remember, I think saying it was mentioned that it's important is that the Bonanno family, they weren't even on the commission at the time. And so uh, they weren't, you know, that was one of the things that, 
was going to be a benefit for them is that John Gotti wanted you know, he was friends with uh, Messino and they would have uh, proposed to get them back on the commission. So at this point, Gotti was under the assumption that uh, Jerry Lang was going to go with him. This is what Sammy says once again with Jerry Lang. Uh, so he had the Columbos. Uh, and then um, we, now where was Tommy Gambino on this? So Tommy Gambino. So what what's happened there? He you know he he's related. You know he's a son of, of Carlo Gambino and also a nephew of a a Big Paul. And so uh, when he gets killed, when Big Paul gets killed, Tommy Gambino's actually was going. He came to the uh, Spark Steakhouse like a couple minutes or maybe a minute after. Paul was killed and they told him just to turn around and leave. And so uh, he was going to meet with um, Paul uh, and Tommy. And, and so anyway, he was like a treasurer for the, the family. This guy was uh, college educated. He, he also had a strategic value because, you know, his wife, Frances was um, Tony Lucchese's daughter. And so uh, that's how Tommy Gambino got the, um, what they call the, you know, he had got the garment industry and that originally had been Lucchese's. But when Tommy Lucchese died, he gave that over to um, Tommy Gambino. And so Gambino was not a killer. He but he was someone that was respected that people knew in the family. And he could have been someone like a consigliere. And, and he was someone. close and he was close to 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 to, to Brown, to Fiala. Yeah, exactly. And he was the close to uh, Gambino's ride. So and th that group all was those. a so, so here's what comes what it comes down to. If if Bilotti lives, I mean, you're mm -hmm. gonna have maybe a war. I don't know if Bilotti has enough to go to war with these other guys. I don't think he does personally, mm -hmm. uh, because Mikey. They, he asked Mikey if he had a, a, a crew. He did have a crew, but he did this not have brother. a crew like John Gotti. He did no. not have a crew like uh, Bobby uh, Fiella, the guys right. that he knew, the old timers there. Mm -hmm. It's just very interesting stuff. And, and it just goes to show you that that these men have died, uh, signed their death warrants. I mean, bloody well, that's the what happened. That, bloody the worst thing that ever happened to him. And this is what Mikey says: it was worst thing to happen to him is he was named underboss. That was a death sentence. Yeah, and then yeah, Chico exactly. was named underboss, a death mm -hmm. sentence. Death sentence. Yep. And okay. and they were both dead. Both of them within four months, they were both dead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the other thing that, that uh, with it with Bellotti, his, you know, his, there's talking about his brother. His brother um, was approached by, um, and this again is based on Sammy. Said they approached his brother, and his brother uh, said he wouldn't seek any retribution. That he accepted the new administration, but that supposedly that was a, one of the first things that that they did after the the hit on Big Paul was to talk to. Uh, Bilotti's brother, make sure that, you know, they could control him or he was going to be killed. He lived the same code as Mikey lived when they came and they killed his brother. And yeah. basically, and that happened in the mob where brothers were killed. Of course. Yeah, it, it was. Time. And you had to accept it because you knew that you were both part of that life and it could happen. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what happened. And, and so, you know, when you see, you know, people, they don't, you know, a lot of people don't understand the life and how, you know, unfortunately the life that becomes more important than blood many times. And so that's just what happened. So did you, so pretty much, did you find this interesting and what do you think, how much did you learn from watching uh, this uh, segment that they did? Well, I learned a lot. I mean, one, I didn't know about, like I said, I didn't know about the relationship between uh, Tony uh, ducks and a uh, Tesla. I didn't know there were. I never heard there. about the car being wired. <laughs> no, no. Uh, well, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. I'd heard of that. I mean, but yeah, that was. But the other thing was, it was interesting to me. And, and I don't know if you, you didn't bring it up, but it's talking about the chin. And so, if you remember, that was something that they. What they said was that you know, they weren't going to approach the chin because that he, they knew that he was too close to Castellano. And it was true. You know, they had a lot of rackets together, you know, a lot of the building and stuff going on in Manhattan. So yeah, that's true. But the thing that was, that Mikey had mentioned that 
that I was thought was interesting was that he said, well, they should have just went to the commission. They would have given uh, him, they would have given them permission to take out Paul because uh, I guess what he was saying was, is that they, they thought that Paul might uh, not be able to take being um, in prison. And so, yeah, if the, if, you know, that'd be the only way of that could happen. And so uh, I just don't, I don't see the chin doing that. I just don't think that Chen would have ever allowed it. And so, uh, especially with John Gotti, he didn't know who the, he didn't really know who John Gotti was except by reputation. And, and also the word on the street was that, you know, he was in, involved in narcotics. And so, you know, that was uh, something that I just don't see Chen allowing some sort of regime move. And we know what happened in Philadelphia. But unfortunately it's not Chen's, uh, well, Chen ha does have power, but, in the end, he's not going to make the Gambino's decisions for them. He's not going to stop a war. John Gotti's not going to sit back with his crew and let this other crew take over. It's just not going to happen. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting stuff. Yeah, um, it is. And I sometimes wonder if maybe we, you know, I know that Chin did, you know, he killed the folk, you know, like Antonio Caponegro. He killed them. And then the, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, there were two bosses that were, were killed, they had taken over in, in Philly. And I, you know, I get that and he had him killed, but the problem was, um, yeah, I don't know how much the chin could have, what the chin's power would have been in this. I just know that, you know, he had his thoughts on who and he, he did have some power there. though, because he seemed to have his hands in everything. Well, he did. With, with the other you know, families, you know? Right, exactly. So, but to be able to say that they could have put in this, you know, put in Brown and, and Danny Marino and Tommy Gambino, and it would have just been all perfect. I don't know about that. I just know that Gotti wasn't going to, he wouldn't have put up with that either. So there would have been a war. Okay. So, well, I would say go to Mikey Scars, watch that. It was very interesting stuff. And this is why I like watching his stuff because it's very educational, especially yeah. for novices like me. Well, it makes you think, you know, it kind of makes you think and it, you start learning stuff that you, you didn't think about, you know, before. Right, right. You know, it, makes you, it makes me ask uh, pretty, you know, different questions. That's what it makes me do. And, yeah. Uh, um, people might say, oh, you're talking about Mikey Scars again. Yeah, but Mikey Scars is offering stuff here for us to learn and to mm -hmm. understand. He makes it simple. And he gives the simple reason. It's not like you're going to a uh, uh, math class and, and learning algebra, uh, yeah. algebra two or something. Right. Um, or calculus okay. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read you a quote and I okay. want you uh, to tell me, okay, there's this thing about, uh, and this, and the show ended with them talking about Gotti being a good or bad boss. Okay. I'm not going to say Gotti's, a good or bad boss. But what I'm going to say is, I'm going to read this to you. You tell me who this is. Okay. He indulged in custom suits, cigars, gourmet food, and drink, and female companionship. He was particularly known for his flamboyant and costly jewelry. His favorite response to questions about, uh, about his activities were, I'm just a businessman, giving the people what they want. And all I do is to satisfy the public's demand. He had become a national celebrity hmm. and talking point. Who do you think I'm name I'm talking about? Well, I mean, it most of that seemed to describe uh, John Gotti. Is it Gotti? Uh, actually, that that's what they said about Al Capone. Uh, ah. Those same words that they they go after John Gotti. Mm -hmm. Okay. When Al Capone was 26 years old, he became, uh, after Torrio was shot, he mm -hmm. took over the family. Right. And five years later, you know where he was five years later? I think he's in prison. He was in prison. And wow. then he got out of prison in his mid 30s well, almost 40. Mm -hmm. He had syphilis. He went down. Yes. So basically, Al Capone is known as being this great gangster when he was a very mediocre gangster at best. And yeah. on top of that, uh, St. Valentine's Day massacre, murdering people in the street like it's nothing. Right. Hundreds of people killed over those five years, period. Innocent people. <laughs> uh, you know, witnesses. 
And so, you know, this is what I'm trying to say. You know, you, you hear this knock on John Gotti, but that's Al Capone I just read to you. Wow. Yeah, I would have thought it was uh, was John Gotti, except, you know, the thing that didn't describe you, you, you didn't really hear John Gotti talk about having women with him all the time. You know, who knows why he did, but, you know, he wasn't in public with a bunch of women. And so, but everything else really, I thought you were talking about John Gotti, to be honest. But, that outfit wow. he has on right there. He has the cane. Yeah. He, has, he looks like he's eating good. He has the, yeah. the nice suit, the fancy hat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So 50, 60 years earlier. And, see, this is, and this is the thing. Before we got into this mob genre, a majority of the people that came into this mob genre loved John Gotti. And then you have people talking about, oh, he was a bad boss. He was a bad boss. Hmm. But then you know what? So was Al Capone. So make sure you keep it clear, people. If, you know, if you, can, you know. Yeah. But that that's true. And and that was interesting, though. I I never thought about it too, that you know, we always hear about Al Capone, but that's interesting. Only basically five years he was thirty-one, dude. He was th wow. he became boss at twenty-six. Wow. Yeah, and by yeah. thirty-one he was in prison. So he yeah. his but, old... That's when I put in thirty-one is when they came down on him. He had some charges before then, just like God he did. He always had trouble with the law, mm -hmm. and th then he was found innocent of his first charge and trial. And then you have the second trial. So, oh. you know, he, he was always in issues, but, you know, uh, he was very flamboyant, more flamboyant than John Gotti was. And you got yeah. to he did this in an era when uh, they didn't have TV cameras everywhere. No, they didn't even have no. TVs. No. This was radio and newspaper. Interesting. And then, yeah, and this was, and yeah, Gotti before he became boss. So he became boss, what, 80 Six early January of eighty six. So he was over eighty six. Well, yeah. he killed in, in December. In yeah. So that means he was a, and then he started like in the late fifties, early sixties. So he, so Gotti was, he on was the on street, street twenty five years, years thirty, 30 years. more years than Al Capone. Wow, I never thought years. about that. That's, now, Al, that's yeah. amazing. But see, that's the thing. You know, if people are going to say things, research stuff. You know, Luciano, yeah. Luciano was kicked out of this country and he went mm -hmm. back to Italy to become a major drug trafficker. Yeah, you've got a point. And, you know, you hear these guys and, and that that really brings up the point of of longevity. You don't have a lot of guys Very like few. that stay, you know, maybe Carlo Gambino was 20 years nearly, but and he was sick the last 10. But, yeah, most of these bosses didn't stick Glenn, around he that died. He died. He went to prison, yeah. came out, and people hated yeah. him. They killed him. Uh, mm -hmm. He didn't last long. Colombo was shot down. Uh, Gallo. Well, Colombo uh, another one that was flamboyant and out there. You Gallo, know? too. Mm -hmm. like, Gallo. You know, he was out there, too, and he died in his 40s. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have, like, this thing. And, and here's what it comes down to. The two most famous gangsters ever are Al Capone and John Gotti. Yeah, that's true. Those are the two. You got rappers called Capone. You got rappers called Gotti. You got no rappers <laughs> called Luciano or, 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 or uh, Gravano. Yeah, you don't have that. But you know what's interesting, too, is how he, the chin, you know, and they're saying that, oh, he was did stuff the right way. But what about... Isn't it kind of weird if you're dr walking around on the street in a bathrobe and that drawing attention to yourself, you know? Basically, you're pretending you're crazy so you don't have to go to prison. Exactly. You're and hiding every incredible. day. You're changing your life every day. Well, and I, I have, and I still believe that if someone does that, they have to be a little bit nuts. You'll have a bunch of people glorify uh, the chin. Mm -hmm. And say what a great boss he was. They won't say that he walked up and down the street acting like a nut job, and uh, and um, then you had Gotti who was walking around uh, basically not caring uh, who that he wanted people, and just like Capone, they mm -hmm. wanted people to know who they were. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And and, and see, I just find that very, that stuff very interesting. A matter of fact, here's the difference between say Gotti. Mm -hmm. Never lie because I don't fear fear anyone. The only you only lie when you're afraid. And then he had another one. It's better to live one day as a lion than a hundred years as a lamb. And you prove that. What you want about John Gotti, but there will never be another John Gotti.
his influence in this genre um, is if there wasn't a John Gotti, you wouldn't have nobody talk. He was front street and a, a gangster. And that's what he wanted to be, and that's what he was. And, uh, you know, you guys can, anybody could say what they want about him, right or wrong or indifferent. The fact of the matter is you can't deny what John Gotti was. Never, hmm. never lie, because I don't feel very interesting, right? Yeah, it is cool. So he talks about, okay, so he talks about being a gangster. He, mm -hmm. he, wasn't, he didn't hide from it. The chin hid from it. Yeah, he did. People may not like what I'm saying about the chin, but the fact is, he walked around, and if you listen to his daughter talk about, he bought it home. Mm. Uh, two different, totally different people. Uh, the Chin was a very powerful man, there's no doubt. But you know, you, when you talk, when you're talking about uh, real gangsters, Al Capone was a real gangster. John Gotti was a real gangster, and they chose to live their flamboyant. But at least John Gotti went to prison in his fifties. Yeah, 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 exactly. In his thirties, Capone was done. He was done. You know, five years, boom, runs the family in Chicago, goes to prison. That's it. Yeah, very true. Yeah, it's just fascinating stuff, though. You're right, Lee. I mean, in, I, you know, it, it's just he brings up talking about that's Mikey Scars and RJ. Their show, you know, it brings up some good points, and it just makes you to think. It makes, it makes you, you think, think about a bunch of mafia stuff. It makes yeah. you. It makes you really think because, you know, people say, oh, these guys were stupid and dumb. They were stupid and dumb guys that built an organization that lasted and still is alive. Oh, yeah. It has Absolutely. structure mm -hmm. uh, all the way through it. You know, it's like the cartel. Same thing. They have structure. But the cartel, they're just slaughtering each other in the street. Oh, yeah. They're slaughtering innocent people. You can't even compare them, to be honest with you. No, not at all. Okay. Well, that's all we have to say, people. Underneath here, please subscribe, hit the like button, and uh, the reminder button. It's uh, This will be up Sunday. We're going to keep it up for the holiday. Uh, have a safe 4th of July. And uh, thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I hope that you uh, learned something from it. How about James? Anything you'd like to say before we close it down? No, no. This was a – I really enjoyed the, the conversation, Lee. So I uh, hope you have a, a happy 4th as well. Well, you know what it is when you have conversation like Mikey putting it out there. Yeah. It's well, you and I. We don't even need cheat sheets. We don't no. need to take notes. We no. just put it up and have a conversation. Yeah, yeah, very true. Okay, no, it's a lot of fun. Okay, you take care, my man. Yep. Take Thank care. you, everybody. And uh, like I said, please subscribe if you haven't. Hit the like if you haven't. Get us to forty five hundred. We're moving on real close. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, 10,545. Yeah. I don't want to go back to 4,500. <laughs> Take care, uh, people. Thanks, everyone.